Hello, my name is Don Carson. I'm a concept artist, designer, and art director in the themed entertainment design business. I've been doing this for over 30 years, uh, primarily in the theme park business, but I've also worked in the computer game design and also uh, theater set design. So I've got this strange, eclectic uh, resume of uh, various things that I do over the years. And one of the things that I've done is uh, for years I've had a, um, a online blog uh, called uh, Theme Park 101 where I uh, have it as sort of a, as a place for essays and conversations and articles about the various strange aspects of theme park design. And one of the projects that I've always secretly wanted to do is I wanted to, to actually go through the entire process of designing an attraction or a dark ride, uh, mainly for the purpose of describing each step of the way through concept, and I never really had time. Um, one of the uh, sort of uh, silver linings of the coronavirus is that we're all forced to stay home, and I all of a sudden find myself having a lot more time than I used to have, and at least I perceived it was an opportunity for me to uh, to work on this project. So about a little over a month ago, I uh, started posting on Instagram the various steps to designing a dark ride, um, the industry that I work in is unique in that uh, I do a lot of my work under NDA, so I have a career that lives primarily in drawers and hard drives that I'm not necessarily allowed to show anybody. Um, when lucky, uh, some of this work gets out in the form of a finished attraction or a show or a game, but more often than not, sometimes those ideas just sort of disappear. So this is an opportunity to just uh, show the process uh, that I go through and designers like myself go through. And it, it is based on a couple of principles. Uh, concept design is sort of a strange art form in that sort of my definition of it is it's art in service of communicating design to the principle, the, the disciplines uh, tasked with making it a reality. This um, means that rather than it being art for art's sake, it has a job to do, which is to describe to those people you're working with how the thing looks, what it's supposed to look, work, how it's supposed to work, and um, to help the conversation along. Another sort of personal philosophy of my own is that in concept design, um, you can use whatever tools do the best job of communicating your design to those people responsible for building it. So even though I graduated from art school in the early 80s, where I was mostly trained, trained with physical mediums like watercolor, pen and ink markers, acrylics, uh, now we have so many more tools, and the tools I use are really based on what's going to do the best job of communicating the design. And sort of my overarching philosophy of all these projects over the years has been to love the process, because often that's the thing you own the most, and also often uh, you don't know whether or not what you're working on is necessarily going to be finished or built, or if once it is built, it has that initial spark of the designs that you put into it. So if you're constantly uh, loving the work that you're doing, then um, you'll have a very fulfilled career. And uh, I've been extremely happy over these years. So uh, jumping in and starting to work on my sort of fake little uh, dark raid project, um, I think that probably all designers that I know have sort of a secret list of those projects that you hope one day you'd be asked to work on but probably won't be. And so for this being a, a little project, and especially one that I'd be doing on my own, I thought, what if I took something really tiny? And um, I've always thought it would be fun to design one of those carnival dark rides that go from town to town during the summer and uh, work within the limitations of something that has to arrive, be erected, uh, work, you know, run for a couple of weeks and then be uh, torn down and moved to the next town and go that process through it again. Um, I personally am not a huge fan of sort of uh, jump scare, rubber, uh, snakes and gore, um, although I have many, many friends that love, love that. that. Um, but when I think of something like this and I think of Halloween, I kind of love to go to those early uh, German uh, depictions of Halloween sort of from the, the 20s and 30s. For me, it, it has kind of a Fleischer Studio 
uh, feel about them. There's something both uh, whimsical and funny and still a little bit sinister about them, these sort of grinning uh, paper mache faces. So I went through the process of doing the Google image search and collecting all these images and wondering whether or not I could build an attraction based upon sort of the aesthetic of this world. And uh, one of the things I do is I'll uh, have a little sketchbook just sitting on my desk and I'll give it a theme. In this, this case, the rules of this sketchbook is that I could draw people, but all the people needed to be made out of pumpkins or squash. So uh, this just sits on my desk and when I'm in a meeting or I have time to doodle, I'll just start scribbling in the sketchbook and so these are me trying out various ways that people could be made out of squash. Uh, as you get further and further into the sketchbook you realize that you're starting to run out of ideas so you start really pushing yourself you know what do they look like where do they live what kind of clothing would they wear and uh, so this is an example of that uh, just um, doodling for the enjoyment and uh, pushing the boundaries of the limitations you gave yourself by giving the sketchbook a theme. You can see I'm starting to get into sort of the abominations section of these pumpkin people, trying to figure out ways that I haven't explored. I think my favorite is this turban squash guy. You know, and what do they do without arms? What if they're, they're multiple pumpkins? So anyway, so that's that was kind of the genesis of this whole idea. And uh, then I started to ask myself, okay, so what kind of clothing would these people wear? And how would they move around? And, and how would they relate to each other? And, and what do younger versions of these people look like? And what kind of buildings would they potentially live in? You know, what, um, you know, how would they interact? And what would their jobs be? And what kind of music do they listen to? And this all sort of culminated in this sketch, which is, much more ambitious than my little sort of traveling show could have. This is more on the sort of small world uh, extravaganza a finale moment. But it, it sets an idea and tone for this idea that these people made of pumpkins could conceivably live together. And uh, also I like the idea that having a more musical uh, through line as opposed to having a linear storyline, each scene was just sort of a joyous uh, song that they were singing an earworm that you would be humming when you left, and all based on this idea of a community made out of pumpkin people. So diving into you know, what my limitations are, I, I'm using SketchUp, which I is kind of my to-go-to you know, software for roughing in 3D stuff. Um, I went to the uh, SketchUp 3D warehouse and I found some some freight trailers for uh, semi trucks, and uh, there's not a whole lot of information as far as how to design these, so a lot of this is just educated guesses on my part. So I don't know whether or not it would take two or three or four trucks to do this, but in my imagination, uh, I have two trucks, uh, trailers, um, the idea being that the sides of the one facing us the, would flap out so that you would have a, a room or an area where you would load and unload. Then you would move into uh, the the, the space between the two trucks, the back truck being the back of the attraction, and then between them, uh, sort of a bridge of uh, other scenes that are all supported by these, these platform uh, scaffolds. Um, I've also included an ADA ramp, which is um, important. I'm not sure if I'll get to theming that, but I wanted to make sure that it was in there. And also, I have uploaded this model to the um, 3D warehouse, if you look for Carnival Dark Ride, you'll find it, and you're more than welcome to make your own ride uh, based on it. Um, so now that I've got a model, um, I now have something to scale that I can start finding out what are my limitations as far as space and what can I fit into the space. And so I uh, built a little ride track and started to break up the rooms. I knew that I wanted there to be at least two big rooms, and of course big is relative when you're talking about uh, a ride that moves from town to town and is uh, in a couple of trucks. So uh, that means that it meant that I have a sort of a mini little room into a larger room and then I've got this really strange long corridor in the back uh, before I go into what would be the finale room and then kind of a, an exit room before you you end up um, coming off of the ride. 
uh, figuring out the ride track um, was determined by a combination of things. One is the blue circle indicates the turning radius of the vehicle. The red circle uh, is the reach distance of somebody who's sitting in the, the vehicle. So I don't want anybody to be able to grab or interact with the, the sets of the characters. Um, there's a little lap bar, uh, so that should keep it restrained. And um, also I know that if any, for any reason it breaks down or there's any emergency, you should be able to get out of the vehicle and get to an exit fairly quickly. Now, I'm not worrying a whole bunch about capacity, which um, for a real attraction, that would be one of the first things I'd have to think about was how many people I can get through uh, during an hour. And also something else I'm not thinking a lot about, or at least I'm not representing, but would need to on a real project is how many exits there are. Uh, the exit signs that would appear in the attraction, my guess is probably there'd be a big double door exit along that back corridor and maybe uh, two others, just so that if there was any problem, uh, you needed to get out quickly or people needed to get in quickly, that uh, you could do so. But, you know, for my little project, I'm going to just um, not spend a lot of attention on that and mainly on the, the concept of stuff. So uh, the next phase is a bubble diagram. Um, they're called bubble diagrams because usually they're just circles where you try to figure out the pacing and the size of uh, various scenes and beats within the story you're trying to tell. Uh, since I already have this model where I've squeezed a track in, I just color-coded the rooms. So I've got a load area, and then I've got a first scene, which I'm calling sort of the hello scene, where you arrive and there's a character welcoming you. The first sort of uh, scene full of lots of characters is the, the sort of outside outskirts of town. It's the rural area. Uh, before you get into the main town. Then I've got that strange long corridor to go down, so I had that being sort of a little bit of a spooky forest that you go down before you enter the scene four, which is sort of downtown, metropolis, uh, pumpkin town, uh, with uh, lots of singing characters. And then finally scene five is sort of a goodbye scene before you, uh, you exit again. Both the hello scene and the goodbye scenes are also a little bit of a, a light barrier. My, thought is that uh, this would be a dark ride. Um, it will allow for a lot more detail to be in the paint as opposed to necessarily be built out in the sets. Um, but there is potential of light leaks. So these two smaller scenes are a way to make sure that when you get into the bulk of the attraction, it's not too um, bright from outside. So the first thing I did is start to play with the marquee. I want to make sure that when people are visiting the fair or see this from a distance, they're getting an idea of what is happening inside, uh, knowing that it's probably a little bit more kid-friendly um, and silly. And I've also, uh, I want it to be kind of like a big flat pop-up billboard, but I also wanted it to have a, a back end so that it had multiple layers. So I brought this into the SketchUp model and you can see uh, what that would conceivably look like as a, a marquee for this attraction. I'm not going to, at the moment, worry too much about how I've themed the outside of the trucks. I'll probably do that once I've gone through the process of designing the entire interior. But for now, this is good. And the same with the, the ADA ramps. I may or may not be theming that. Uh, most of the focus is going to be on the inside and how the, um, the various uh, scenes lay out. So the next thing is... Uh, now. I've already got this model in the computer, so I could start designing it in the computer, and that's certainly something that could be done. But um, from my past experience, I've found that uh, one of the absolute fastest way to get a concept figured out is to build a, a, a really, really simple foam core model. So this is a black foam core. I've, I've indicated the track just with a white you know, Prismacolor pencil. I've got lots of hot glue and I'm using pins to start pin th pinning things together. It's a uh, half inch to the foot. It's sitting on my work table in my studio. And then for the next couple of, well, next week really, I'm going to just start filling it. I'm going to start at the front and I'm going to start drawing on sort of uh, heavy cardstock white pieces of paper and using a uh, pencil and then a uh, felt marker. I'm going to just start scribbling. Uh, each uh, scene and the characters in the attraction. Uh, the goal is not to come up with something finished, it's to see how these pieces work together. So 
once you get it in there, you get an idea of uh, the scale. Um, it is measurable since it is to scale, and uh, you can understand how the walls are being covered. Uh, this is a really fast way, and I'm not really worried about uh, how beautiful the drawings are. They're just indications so far. So once I start getting in from scene to scene, I'll put in a blank piece of paper. I'll start trying to figure out the eye line, you know, what you're seeing as you're turning corners, and I'll start to rough it in in pencil, and then I'll start to ink it, and uh, for those multiple planes and layers, I'll start cutting those out and start adding those to the model as well. So over time, you end up with a little physical model that has paper representations of the sets, the characters, and then these uh, wraparound uh, murals that are sort of hiding the corners of your rooms. Now in the past, sort of the the old school way of, doing, of working with this, we would, uh, if we could get or borrow or rent time on, we would get what we called a lip skip stip uh, camera, which was a small little camera that was attached to a thick cable that attached to a VCR, and we could take that little uh, camera and we could snake it through an attraction and get an idea of what it's like to, to be the size of the the vehicle moving through the scenes. And uh, that would come out in the form of a shaky a VHS tape or uh, some really, really low res prints. But we just thought it was a miracle. And uh, we, we now live in the 21st century and we all carry around in our pockets uh, something that's even better, much higher resolution, and allows us to take shots from inside of the attraction. What's especially great is that uh, you very, really quickly get to feel what it's like to move through the space. You get to see how each scene sort of presents itself as you move from one to the next. And you get that sort of first person view very quickly uh, to help you understand how all the many layers of your uh, attraction are starting to lay out. And again, uh, it's an iterative process, so I'm constantly drawing, uh, gluing, sticking it in there, checking it, drawing again, making changes. Um, things like scale, you know, if I feel a character is a little too big or a little too small, I can always change that later. Um, but right now I'm just getting an idea of how the layers work together. So this is that long corridor scene. I don't have a lot to work with. There's not a lot of walls that I can cover, but I can create sort of a tunnel, a multi-plane tunnel that you're moving through. And I've got characters uh, that would probably be black light uh, painted, maybe slightly sculpted uh, and animated so that they're singing at you uh, to sort of uh, draw your attention to, away from the fact that not a whole lot going on in here. And then at the very end, I've um, got uh, some characters that I would spend a little bit more uh, time and animation and money on that would draw you to the end so you didn't feel like you were just stuck in a long hallway. So the process I use is super simple. Um, uh, the red pencil is something we picked up from the uh, Disney animators. They were across the street from us at Imagineering during the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, the advantage to the red pencil is that you can be as loose as you want. And after you, uh, you scan it, you can bring it into Photoshop and just choose the red channel and turn it off. And you're left with just the black and white line. Uh, there's nothing uh, fancy about this. This is just sort of freeform sketching, and then I'll come in with the felt marker and loosely sort of ink in uh, some of the lines. I know that I'm going to get it more than enough chance later on to get all detailed, but for now, this is more than enough to get a feel for what this is going to look like when it's all together uh, in the model. So. Here's that finale scene with some of the characters in it. You can see that wrapped around backdrop uh, that's set uh, behind them. All the characters are just cut out and, and placed temporarily. They're literally just pinned in. And I can start getting an idea of, the, of how to fill this scene. Um, initially, my idea is just a packet full of you know, people that are singing at you. So I'm not so worried. Uh, later on, I can figure out scale and, and what you should look at from one thing to the other. But mostly, I just want it to feel like there's so much stuff in there that you couldn't possibly see everything. 
And then I have these sort of fun acrobat characters at the very end, and they're in that goodbye scene where they're uh, saying goodbye to you. So here's a, a short little video with me talking about uh, the model, and uh, now that it's pretty much done. Well, I did it. I finished the model. Um, it's good to remember this is only just sort of a rough sketch, but boy, doing stuff in paper and with foam core and hot glue really is a wonderful way to really quickly see how scenes can lay out and give you an idea of what you really can or cannot fit inside a show box. I highly recommend if you're planning on doing a similar project that you consider doing this as a first pass. Uh, it, it's quick, it's enjoyable, and it really helps you understand what your limitations are. You can always tighten up later, but it's amazing how many of those early ideas end up in the finished project. So that's the model. By the time I got to this point, I thought I'd pretty much covered all the surfaces that I thought needed covering. Uh, one of the things you can do in dark rides is that if there's something that um, you don't want it, people to pay attention to, you can just leave it black, you know, just leave it in the shadows. Um, in this particular case, most of the surfaces are covered, but things like the walls of the back corridor I left as black, assuming that the, the blackness would be enough and your focus would be on those arches. So that was great, but we now, you know, we live in the 21st century, so the easiest way to share this with other people, apart from that little video that I did, was to get this into a digital form. And so to do that, now that I have all the scenes and I have them to scale, I'll scale you know, place all the pieces and characters on a flatbed scanner with a scale to make sure that I'm making sure that they're all to the right size. And then I'll scan them. In this image, the red area would actually be tr completely transparent in a PNG so that I could cut the characters out loosely. It also means that later, uh, if I make changes to the character, uh, I don't have to worry about staying within the bounds of the, the size that I've, I've determined. I can change it uh, here in this uh, file the PNG and then uh, re-export it to the model to make those changes. So it took about oh I, several days, a full weekend, but I was able to turn what was only a physical model into a virtual model by bringing all these set pieces, these rough drawings, into my SketchUp model. Uh, the advantage that now that I have it in a SketchUp form is that I can share this with the rest of the team, I can email it to people, but best of all is now that it's in a digital form, I can actually get inside of it and I can wander around. I'm using a program that is an extension for uh, SketchUp that's really changed a lot of the way that I uh, work. It's called Enscape. I highly re recommend you try it. Uh, it allows you to uh, get inside the model. It's a real-time renderer, which means that very much like a video game, you don't have to wait for hours for the three-day software to, to render. It actually renders real-time. So things like uh, 360 wraparounds, which we can look at in a VR headset or, or using uh, your phone with the, with the, you know, like a Google Cardboard attached to it uh, can very quickly get you inside the ride to see how things are working. The other thing that it lets you do too is you can start to uh, do ride-through videos. So this is me just running a camera along the track uh, that I've laid out and this is the first time I'm getting a chance to actually ride around in that paper model that I, I spent time on. Um, what's amazing about this process is that not only do you really get to see what you see as you move through a space and the timing and how long you get to see it, but you immediately start seeing where the holes are. Those areas that you thought were not important start to feel a little bare, and those areas that feel like they need more attention, uh, you can start making changes to. So I had a list of about 50 things almost immediately that I wanted to alter and fix. Uh, once I did this initial ride through. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that um, that it was only like a week and a half that this was just an idea 
and here I am actually riding around inside my design. This is a kind of a new thing. Um, these tools uh, are fairly new. They've been around for a little bit, but uh, the accessibility and the quality of your renders is uh, so superior now that there's no reason why, even at this super rough phase of the project, that I, I couldn't start writing around in something that was at this early uh, a phase in the concept design. So I'm constantly going back to uh, re-render and revisit an attraction as I'm adding things. This is also an opportunity for me to start to figure out more detail on these characters. So starting with the really, really rough drawing that I did in the model, I'll bring it into Procreate, uh, which is a wonderful program on the iPad Pro. And I'm just sitting, you know, on my on couch in the evening, or used to be in airplanes, um, I would do a rough drawing just to tighten it up and then do the finished ink drawing. Then I would fill them with color and then use that sort of as a mask and I could uh, color in the, the characters. These would also be cut out uh, very much like the scenery in my, uh, my paper model and brought into SketchUp. So I can swap out these characters with those rough characters in the model so you can see what they look like really quickly in the scale. So I'm starting to just sort of pick characters to try to, to figure out the color and the, the mood of um, what these characters might look like and how they might be lit. Uh, and, as, and as far as lighting is concerned, since it would be black light, I don't have to worry about, uh, the, well, really, I, I can make lighting decisions in the paint itself rather than worrying about how the light will hit them in the attraction. So the other wonderful benefit to... Uh, having a 3D model is that now I can actually experience this ride virtually through uh, virtuality goggles. Um, I use the Oculus Rift. I've also used the um, HTC Vive headset. Both are excellent at it. And I'm using Enscape again. Uh, it's a plug and play. While in SketchUp, I can just uh, put it on, press a button, and I'm inside the model. So here's a short little video of one of my early walkthroughs of the attraction. Okay, I'm in VR right now, and I wanted to give you an idea of what it's like to wander around inside your model in virtual reality. Uh, forgive me if I move my head around too much and it causes a little emotion sickness. I'll try not to do it uh, too much. I'm going to first just drop myself here into the load area. And uh, one of the things that VR allows you to do is completely relate to the model. Um, even in this rough stage, um, I can move around and just you know, look everywhere. I immediately, I'm at a walking height, so I can feel what it's like to, to like wander around inside this attraction during a maintenance check. Uh, get a feel for what it's like to be near the figures, uh, what their scale is. Um, whether or not doorways are too low or too high, uh, see what it looks like behind scenery, um, see whether or not there's stuff that's visible that you know really shouldn't be, um, and some things that uh, have attention has been lavished on that you know maybe are unnecessary. Uh, the videos are really nice, but being able to just wander around in here is especially good. Uh, you get a real feel immediately for what it's like. To, to be in the space. Um, also in the videos, we tend to focus on uh, what everybody wants, we want everybody to see, but also I can like turn around and just have a look at what the scenery is doing um, behind me as well. So uh, I just highly recommend if you have an opportunity to experience your designs in virtual reality, it's just the way to go. And I think it's also, worth mentioning that uh, I started working on this project at the end of March, and already I'm able to wander around inside of my concept model, even with my sort of quick Sharpie characters uh, sitting in as placeholders. Um, like I said before, one of the advantages to virtual reality is that when you wander around in here, within the first 10 seconds, you get a really good idea what doesn't work in your design and what does work. Uh, often I'll jump in and out of 
VR and make tweaks, then jump back in again, jump out again, make more tweaks, and uh, really get a feel for what it's like to be inside the attraction. So um, this is what it looks like so far. Lots more work to do. Thanks for following along. So um, I will constantly jump into VR to check on new things that I've changed, uh, see what's not working, make alterations, and go back into VR again just to, to make sure that it's, that it's fixing the problems. Another advantage, too, is because I went through the process of scanning those rough drawings from the paper model, I have these texture files that then I can uh, do a more final artwork, more uh, tighter line work, some color, and then just by replacing the file, the color file in the SketchUp model, I'm able to immediately just replace the scenery in my model. So uh, it's, it's a little bit like Christmas. Every time you do it, you get this little gift of being able to see the attraction get better and better and more detailed as you continue. So you can see the contrast between the, the tighter uh, color pieces and set pieces and characters, and then still the early uh, marker uh, sketches from the, the model. Another thing that you uh, can start thinking about is the, the themed treatment of the ride vehicle. Because you have a model of it, you can start throwing textures on it and see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, since this is a carnival dark ride, I'm not going to worry about an elaborate vehicle that's got lots of fiberglass pieces on it. This is really just a sort of a vinyl print that would be applied to each vehicle. Uh, ultimately, I'd love each vehicle to have a different face so that there's something unique about your vehicle compared to another vehicle. But then I can quickly get it into uh, the model and have a look at what that looks like in context with the, uh, the scenery that is going in. Um, one other thing, too, that the computer allows us is the ability to do what we, I call a first article, which is I have this idea about how I want the characters to look and, and act, and I could draw them, but it's just as easy for me to build a, a quick model and animate it. So in this particular case, I've got really a pumpkin with some you know, jack-o'-lantern with holes for the mouth and the eyes, and I have an animated texture that I built in After Effects, and I've just textured it to the, that mouth and eyes so you get an idea of what it might look like uh, if it was a dimensional character. My guess is that rather than uh, rear projected, it would be some uh, LED panels that would be sliced, uh, placed behind those openings. So you could, uh, you could, could have a lot of animation and movement in the, uh, the mouth and the eyes. And it would also be much easier to sync the mouth up with the soundtrack so that if all the characters are singing the same song, their mouth movements are, uh, are the same. So I, I have a feeling since I've got this little Carnival Dark Ride, I'm not gonna end up with fully dimensional characters. Probably something more bar relief. I know that because I'm uh, gonna be working in blacklight, I could conceivably have them be flats. Because, but we're moving laterally through the space, and because of parallax, I think even in the dark, you're going to be able to tell that these characters are flat. So uh, I, I I'll probably end up going with something with a bar relief or a little bit dimension. Since this is just a, a pretend ride, I can probably do whatever I want, but I thought I would test it. I have that After Effects file of the eyes and the mouth, so I took and I made a black foam core cutout of a jack-o'-lantern, uh, cut out the eyes and the mouth, and I just laid it over my iPad to see whether or not I could get an interesting effect. And uh, even if the attraction went completely flat, uh, I think it would be a nice and relatively inexpensive way to get a lot of life and animation into these characters without having to have them be fully animatronic. And speaking of animation, uh, trying to figure out what the movements are uh, for your, your character is important because uh, the, an estimator will be joining the project and they're going to have to figure out the cost of these characters based upon the amount of functions that they have. So in the case of this, uh, this pumpkin pie seller guy, he's probably going to be one of the, the key uh, characters. So he'll have a lot more functions than maybe another one that might only have a little bit of a head movement or a, a head movement. Um, so uh, I'm not an engineer, so I would be working with a team member who was. 
Um, but my guess is it probably would have an armature similar to what's depicted in here, so you could uh, show the the movement. Uh, you know, his arms are both attached to each other, and then you have a leg, and the other leg is hitting the uh, that's on the ground is static, and then that teetering pies on the top is uh, not necessarily being animated, but just responding to the movement of the head and the neck. Also, to help communicate this idea that these characters aren't necessarily fully sculpted, uh, but uh, or bar relief, or maybe even open in the back, I did this sort of diagram that describes uh, how they could conceivably be constructed uh, so that uh, I can have a conversation with those people who will eventually be fabricating them to see whether or not we can come up with something that is not completely flat but has some dimension to it. Another real advantage uh, to having friends in this industry is to be, the ability to bounce ideas off of uh, fellow designers. Um, my friend uh, Joe and Cicero, who I've worked with uh, off and on for years, uh, he is a master of uh, character staging. And so I sent him the first ride through video and asked for his comments. And he gave me a list of potential changes to the, the personalities of the characters to help them be a little bit more dynamic. dynamic. So I'm looking forward to bringing those changes into the, the ride. One of them was to have the, uh, the character that's in the pie booth be a little upset with the other person for being so careless as to balancing all those pies. Um, so it adds a, a nice sort of dynamic between the characters so that all of them are singing and dancing. There are some of them that are a little bit concerned about how impractical the choices have, are, are of the fellow characters. Another wonderful advantage to having very talented friends is that uh, my friend Cullen Vance, who uh, is a, an incredible musician and animator and storyteller and you name it, um, he was uh, graciously willing to start trying to figure out what kind of music would happen in this attraction. And we had a similar idea of just how uh, reminiscent it was of those early sort of cartoons and honky-tonk feel. So here's a couple of loops. Uh, the first one is the loop for the load area. Uh, all of these loops would be going continuously, and he's designing them so that uh, no matter when you transition from one scene to the next, you can uh, the, the transition will be relatively smooth from one theme to the next. So here's the load area. So that would play as you're getting in the vehicles, and once you turn the corner and you start heading into that rural part of Pumpkin Town, uh, then this loop would kick in. So that's the loop, and I highly recommend you check out uh, Cullen's Spotify page. He has uh, several albums, and uh, also look for him on YouTube and Instagram. He does wonderful stop-motion animations, and uh, just an incredibly talented uh, friend of mine. Um, now that we have the music files, we can start using Enscape to start placing the speakers that would uh, emit the sound effects as you are moving through it. And Enscape works very similarly to how an audio engineer would work with uh, the music not necessarily filling a space but following the track. So as you're moving along, you're moving from one speaker to the next. Um, I'm not an audio engineer, so there would be a lot of more science that would go into this. But for the purpose of just this concept, I can place uh, Cullen's uh, files as speakers in the model and then I can render off another ride-through to help you 
feel what it's like to move from one uh, scene to the next. Um, this is currently where the model is, and uh, the music only goes about halfway because we're still working on the, the music for the rest of the attraction. But you'll also see a lot of the upgrades that went into the, uh, each of the scenes, especially as color is starting to come in. Um, as I said, I wasn't planning on doing all color, but so far uh, as the, uh, the stay-at-home order uh, persists, I keep working on it. So you never know. So here we go, here's a ride through with the music and then where the color is so far. So that's where the music would transition to something a little bit spookier as it made its way to uh, the downtown finale. But you can see I've added a lot more stuff on the side, uh, not to focus, but just to give you a sense of place. And then you turn into the finale scene full of all the, the animated characters and the street scenes. So this is where the attraction is at the moment, still evolving as I move from scene to scene. And uh, the ultimate goal is to have music throughout. So that's it so far. Um, it's come a lot further than I initially had intended it to, but there's more to do. Um, if you're interested, you can follow the progress on my Instagram page. Uh, I keep posting updates there. Uh, it's been wonderful to do. Uh, it's been really nice to be able to show off the various steps that we go through when we're doing an attraction. Um, each attraction is different, so uh, this is a really silly little musical uh, ride and has limitations that maybe a larger attraction doesn't necessarily have but uh, it gives you an idea of the various tools that might be used in the process and uh, I highly recommend you you check them out. Uh, in the end I think I would like to take the, the entire attraction into Unity so that I can export a build that allows you to actually sit in the vehicle and ride around in VR and look around on your own. But that'll come later and uh, we'll see whether or not I have enough stamina to color the rest of the model in. But thanks so much for listening and checking it out. And uh, we'll see what happens on the other end of this uh, interesting times we live in. Thanks a lot.